I'm Nicole Burley. It is Monday, August 2nd. Here's what's making headlines right now on Rush Hour. The White House saying the country has reached the 70% vaccination mark as mask mandates are reinstated across the country. President Biden weighing in on the eviction moratorium that expired over the weekend, now calling on states to protect people at risk of losing their homes. And a travel nightmare for Spirit Airlines passengers all across the country as that airline grounds hundreds of flights. Our thousand of News Nation journalists are spread across the country, turning news stories all day. In Florida, a COVID crisis developing. Over the weekend, the state setting pandemic records for hospitalizations and new cases. And new tonight from the border, hundreds of immigrants being held under a Texas bridge. News Nation live on the ground there. In parts of the West and Southwest, bombarded with flash floodings. And we've learned of at least one death being reported in Utah. But we begin tonight in Washington, D.C., where the White House is focused on containing the recent rise in COVID cases, many of them among the vaccinated. The latest CDC number showing that new patients hospitalized with COVID the highest since March. News Nation White House correspondent Allison Harris live for us tonight in D.C., where the COVID response team just wrapped up a briefing. So, Allison, what were the key points? Well, Nicole, unfortunate news. There's a new milestone today, but the U.S. is moving in the wrong direction. The U.S. surpassed today 35 million COVID cases, with cases among the unvaccinated absolutely exploding. Daily cases are now higher than our peak that we had last summer. And now tonight, South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham says he has tested positive at the Capitol this afternoon after being fully vaccinated, saying that he has flu-like symptoms. And he says that he's glad he was vaccinated because, as he says, without getting the shots, he believes that his symptoms would be even worse. He's the latest Republican to advocate for vaccination, this time as a breakthrough case himself. At the same time, as cases are up, so are vaccinations. 70% of American adults now have at least one shot. Right now, the U.S. has its highest weekly average of people getting vaccinated in a month. And if you need more evidence that the shots are working, even with case rates higher than last summer. There were 67 COVID deaths yesterday compared to about 800 COVID deaths a year ago. The White House today reiterating following that news about breakthrough cases, the news about Senator Lindsey Graham, that breakthrough cases remain mild and rare with nearly all recent COVID deaths being among people who are not vaccinated. Now, Louisiana is the state with the lowest vaccination rate, and it is seeing an increase in people getting their shots, people getting vaccinated. The White House COVID team calling the increase in vaccinations in Louisiana remarkable and urging these vaccinations to continue all across the country. The governor of Louisiana tonight, just hours ago, reinstated a mask mandate indoors statewide for everyone who's five and up, saying that COVID is threatening their ability to deliver care in hospitals in Louisiana. There are four 40 hospitals in the state, 40, that are now asking for staffing help, according to the governor's spokesperson. Now, the president's spokeswoman today says that the White House stands ready to assist states that are experiencing the, some of the worst outbreaks, states like Louisiana and Florida. And get this, Nicole, one in three cases nationwide this week were in Texas and Florida. All right. Wow, Allison. We are glad to see, though, more vaccinations in Louisiana. All right. Thank you. Well, we'll get to more top stories tonight out of Texas and California. But right now, let's stay in D.C., where a recently released congressional report offering some fresh insight into the origins of the pandemic. Joe Khalil live for us tonight at the Capitol. Of course, Joe, everyone wants to know how this started. So tell us what is in that report. Yeah, well, Nicole, this is a Republican uh, report here, and the people behind this say that the a new report says to them it is now clear. The evidence that's now available, they say, strongly suggests uh, that COVID could have spread because of a lab accident uh, in Wuhan. Now, as evidence, they point to a few things. It uh, shows the Chinese government officials made a public database basically disappear one night back in late 2019, sometime between 2 and 3 in the morning, Wuhan time. Now, the data showed virus samples from bats and mice 
We haven't seen it since. And the report also cites an outbreak of a very serious illness at the military Olympic Games in Wuhan, and the symptoms mirrored COVID. Again, also back in the fall of 2019. And they also cite Chinese scientists and the U.S. State Department, both of whom documented their concerns that the Wuhan lab wasn't taking proper safety measures and that dangerous lab leaks were possible. So we spoke to Congressman Mike Garcia today. He told us that the U.S. and its allies at this point need to be holding China accountable. The Chinese Communist Party, and specifically, uh, we're culpable for this and, and are liable for this. And, and what this latest uh, amendment to the report shows is that there is now tangible evidence of suspicious activity. Now, to be clear, none of this is a smoking gun. We, do, we still don't know for sure uh, the origin theory and whether or not it pans out. But President Biden ordered a full 90-day investigation into the origins of COVID. Uh, clearly, China is not going to be cooperative in that investigation, Nicole. They made that very clear with the World Health Organization. Yeah, no smoking gun there, Joe, but certainly some alarming elements. All right, Joe, thank you. What's the latest, though, uh, switching from that on the infrastructure deal? Well, today the Senate, uh, they continue debating this $1 trillion bill. Both sides right now working on amendments to it. Now, the bipartisan negotiators that we spoke with say that there aren't going to be any you know, drastic uh, amendments that may make this package difficult to vote for. And party leaders on both sides, they still have hope that the final vote on this package could come, Nicole, by the end of this week. All right, Joe Khalil live for us tonight from the Capitol. All right, thank you. Well, let's shift now to the latest from the border. Some shocking new images showing hundreds of immigrants being de detained under a bridge near the Texas border. News Nation correspondent Janelle Fort live for us tonight in Dallas. So Janelle, is the White House saying anything about this new footage? Nicole, not yet, but this is really a continuation of what lawmakers on both sides of the aisle have been criticizing the Biden administration for. New images show what appears to be upwards of a thousand migrants being held underneath the bridge in Mission, Texas. Uh, this is the Anzaluas International Bridge. We confirmed with the Border Patrol that this specific bridge is serving as a temporary processing center. And they said that they moved to these temporary processing centers at the beginning of the year uh, outdoors, uh, mostly because of COVID-19 precautions. And this specific bridge is relatively close to one of the known crossings over the Rio Grande. It depicts a grim reality of the sheer numbers that's going on on our southern border right now. According to U.S. Rep. Henry Quaylar, there are more than 3,000 apprehensions just yesterday alone in the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, based on data from the Border Patrol, we're looking at a 21-year high in the number of migrants attempting to make the dangerous trek uh, over the border and into the United States. Uh, last month, nearly 200,000 people attempted to make that dangerous track. Republicans are calling this a catastrophe. Texas Senator Ted Cruz tweeting that what's going on at the border is a true disaster and a revolving door that migrants are taking advantage of. Colorado Senator Ken Buck called the images outrageous. And Nicole Cuellar, who is a Democrat, has called on the White House to step in and help. He's partnered with uh, Republican Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina to pin a letter to the White House uh, asking them to do something about this. Yeah, 200,000 last month alone. That's a lot. All right, Janelle, thank you. Well, another bloody weekend of gun violence from coast to coast. At least 30 people shot in New York City, 10 of them hurt in just one incident. Now in Chicago, more than 50 people shot, eight fatally. And that's just a week after a reported 70 shooting victims. And in Washington, D.C., there were nearly three times as many murders in July than there were COVID deaths. D.C. also, of course, the site of that mass shooting outside Nationals Park. Now in Oregon, the city of Portland in the grips of a gun violence epidemic. And News Nation, Michael Shore is live for us tonight. Michael, the police department says right now it's struggling to find new recruits. Uh, Nicole, good afternoon to you. That's exactly right. Uh, this police department in Portland, uh, like so many police departments around the country, including that in Los Angeles here, having trouble hiring. What's going on in Portland, though, a little different. They disbanded some of their task forces there in the wake of police protests last year, and now they're paying the price for that. It's an American city that has seen more than 600 shootings in the first half of this year alone. In Portland, Oregon in 2020, there were 900 for the entire year. Mayor Ted Wheeler, a Democrat, is also the commissioner of Portland's police department. 
a city that became a flashpoint in a national wave of police protests last year in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. In response, Mayor Wheeler and the city council approved a series of sweeping reductions in policing, disbanding a task force called the Gun Violence Reduction Team, a specialized unit focused on curbing gun violence and which had faced criticism for disproportionately targeting people of color. Now with a stunning rise in shootings, the city trying to bring the program back, but few on the force are signing up. Lieutenant Greg Pashley explains that that's because of a wariness in the community and a lack of clarity for officers on the structure and future of the unit. And it's something that as the police, we want to be able to do something about. And so it, we hope that if we can put together this team, um, we can begin doing more work to prevent harm to people in our community. Lieutenant Pashley telling me today, Nicole, that what he sees as a problem in his uh, in his force is not so much that they can't get people onto the force, is that these things were disbanded and they have to find a way around that and ensuring a future for these special task forces. Nicole? Yeah, well, speaking of those special task forces, that violence reduction team, what's really the biggest obstacle to getting recruits? Yeah, it's a great question. I think what you're what you're looking at, and again, telling me, um, you know, telling you what what Lieutenant Pashley told me was, first of all, it's just been listed, and getting people within a department to change over or sign up is always a challenge. The other problem is they don't know who the sergeants are. A lot of police officers want to know who the leadership team is going to be. And again, uh, the last one was disbanded. Will there be a future? And then when you have something that's already been disbanded, you want to make sure that you get people that can commit to doing it, and the and the, the community gave a lot of pushback. They've changed the name. They want it to be the Focused Initiative Team, FIT. Maybe that will help the community to understand a little bit more about what the police intend to do in Portland. Nicole? Yeah, it certainly makes it harder to get those commitments. All right, Michael, thank you. Well, from Oregon, let's shift now to Southern Florida, where authorities have released this body cam footage. It's of an arrest at a South Beach hotel, but it turned physical. This happened just last week. Now five officers are facing criminal charges. News Nation's Brian Enton live to, for us tonight from Miami. So Brian, tell us about these charges. Well, all five of the Miami Beach police officers face battery charges. The state attorney here called what you're about to see in this video unfathomable. It happened at this South Beach hotel behind me one week ago. The video starts like this. 24-year-old Delonta Crudup has his hands in the air, held a gunpoint by a Miami Beach police officer. They say he initially ran from them on a scooter. Even with him on the ground, cuffed, more than 20 officers show up and pile on. And then come the kicks. Officer Kevin Perez kicks Crudup in the head. Then Sergeant Jose Perez kicks him. Not just once, but twice. Later, Officer Perez is back, kicking him yet again. Body cam video shows one of the kicks from another angle. And then there's a punch. All of this while the suspect is cuffed on the ground. When we saw that kick to the head, and then we, and then we replayed it, and we'd see all the other kicks that pre pre preceded it, it was just unfathomable. It was unspeakable. It was just inexcusable. Miami-Dade State Attorney Catherine Fernandez-Rundle says that's not all that was inexcusable. Look at this. A bystander is videoing the incident on his cell phone when a different Miami Beach police officer, Officer Robert Saboteur, tackles the bystander. Watch again. He's filming on his cell phone, not involved, when the officer goes in for the tackle. That officer and four others are now charged with misdemeanor battery. Moving forward, I can tell you that my staff and I promise you, as individuals and as an agency, we will learn from this and we will grow from this and we will do better. And all five of those Miami Beach police officers uh, turned up at the police station this morning for processing, but they will not actually be booked into the jail or have to spend the night in jail because uh, it is just a misdemeanor. They will just have to report to court. Nicole. All right, Brian, I know you weren't expecting this question, but uh, it seems like this happened really quickly. I mean, this just happened last week. They're already facing charges. Yeah, it is very, very fast. We don't normally see these kinds of things happen so quickly. Literally just a week ago, uh, this happened. Normally it would take months. They would have to review all the video, but the police chief was not happy with what he saw. He went straight to the state attorney, and now one week later, you've got five officers charged. Nicole? Yeah, really shocking video there. All right, Brian, thank you. Well, tonight, R. Kelly facing more allegations of abuse, this time from 15 new accusers. Federal prosecutors have filed additional motions in the r &B singer's case, which doesn't go to trial for weeks. News Nation correspondent Tom Negevin live for us tonight in New York. Tom, 
That's where Kelly is being held as he awaits that court date. That's exactly right. He remains in custody, Nicole. A very unusual uh, series of events unfolding in court. It's already unusual because this is a RICO case. R. Kelly essentially accused of using his music career as one might a criminal enterprise to recruit underage girls for sex and use violence, intimidation, and isolation to keep them under his control. We're talking about dozens of counts involving half a dozen victims identified only as Jane Doe's one through six, but now, as you mentioned right off the top, federal prosecutors here want to add 15 more, not new charges, just new counts, new alleged victims. The idea would be to sway the jury, but today we have R. Kelly's defense team pushing back calling this untimely, saying it's depriving their client of his constitutional rights, of his right to a fair trial because they're moving too quickly, too close to the trial date, not giving them enough time to prepare as their client sits in a jail cell. Broke, he says. Federal prosecutors say mm, they're not so sure about that. Dropped by his label, at least publicly, a pariah in the music industry, allegations now going back decades. That's the question for the federal judge. Will she allow those counts to be brought in? It's expected she'll decide by the end of the week. Jury selection, though, Nicole, expected to begin a week from today. Yeah, but there's going to be so many aisles on, or eyes on that trial. All right, Tom, thank you. Well, let's switch to weather now. Tonight, Utah bracing for another round of storms after many areas were ravaged by flash floods over the weekend. And we know a coal miner is dead after his vehicle was flipped by the rushing water. News Nation's Jordan Vertadero from our Salt Lake City station, KTVX, is live for us tonight in Enix. So, Jordan, the city there under a state of emergency. Nicole, it's a busy day here in Enoch. The city is in the far southwest part of Utah, about a three and a half hour drive from Salt Lake City. And flash floods damaged about every home in this community of about 7,000. And people from all over this county are coming together to help the small community clean up. The mayor says about 200 homes are damaged. For most people here, that means water damage in their basements and first floors. One family I talked to says everything in their basement is gone, including their children's bedrooms after they say backed up sewage water seeped in. What's on people's minds now is, how are they gonna pay for all of this? Many tell me they don't have flood insurance, so they're hoping the city or county will help with the cost. And the city does have a web page set up asking people to report storm damage, and it states they're trying to facilitate state and federal emergency funding, but that's not guaranteed yet. Back to you, Nicole. All right, Jordan, thank you. Yeah, such a mess there in Utah. And flooding and mudslides in Colorado today led the governor there to declare a state disaster. And check out this video of a suspected tornado. This was spotted today near Orlando. So let's bring in Chief Meteorologist Albert Ramon. And Albert, just still so much active weather all around the country. Yeah, and you mentioned Colorado with flash flood concerns. Colorado, one of six states in the West dealing with flash flood watches that are posted tonight. This is a look at the monsoon moisture with showers and thunderstorms in portions of New Mexico and Arizona, some of which has turned severe northward to south of Salt Lake City with some active flash flood warnings. You see the showers extending off towards the north in Idaho and Montana. So how much rainfall? I think some of the heaviest rain is going to be focused in northern sections of New Mexico into Colorado. That's where we have a moderate threat for flooding for tomorrow, upwards of two inches in some of these spots and notice the heavy rainfall we're expecting later this week, especially midweek along the mid-Atlantic in the southeast. That could be some really heavy rainfall exceeding half a foot of rain. Now, the other big story that we're tracking is the heat out towards the west. Heat advisories, excessive heat warnings in effect. Desert southwest, Pacific northwest with some heat advisories as well. Temperatures in the triple digits, some of which could tie, if not break records over the next two days, Southern California into portions of southwest uh, Arizona. So we'll be keeping an eye on the heat, the rain, the storm chances out west and also in the east this week, Nicole. You are busy. All right, Albert, thank you. Well, so hello tonight on Rush Hour, we now know Simone Biles will compete for an Olympic medal before leaving Japan. We'll tell you why she decided to come back for the balance beam. Plus a flight fiasco on a plane in Texas. What led to fists flying during landing? Team USA gymnastics leader Simone Biles says she is in for her final event. So let's bring in News Nation's Aaron Nolan here with all the Olympic headlines. 
Aaron Biles will be competing on the balance beam. Yeah, exciting times. You know, we've passed the halfway point of the 2020 Olympics, and the news out of Tokyo continues to be centered on Nicole, who you just mentioned, Simone Biles. The questions of will she or won't she? You might remember Biles pulled out of the team competition, then sit out of the all-around. And the early individual event, she was out as well. But that all changes as she's in for the beam. USA Gymnastics sent out the tweet confirming the news early this morning saying Suni Lee and Samo Biles will both compete in the balance beam final. Now, this is the last event for women's gymnastics in the Tokyo Games. Could this event be the greatest of all time swan song? Only time will tell. Also making headlines today, big losses from Team USA in really unexpected ways. The women's soccer team with a second loss in these games this one moves them out of gold medal contention. Today, Team USA lost to Canada 1-0. to The women play Australia in the bronze game on Thursday. Also, the men's baseball team lost in extra innings to Japan 6-5. to America does still have medal hopes in baseball, but cannot lose another game. And finally, this one is buzzing on social media. A New Zealand athlete has been cleared to compete in Tokyo after questions of her transitioning to a woman. Laurel Hubbard is 43 years old and competing in weightlifting today. Now, eight years ago, she began transitioning to a woman and met all of the International Olympic Committee standards and rules to lift in the competition. But today, she did not score a lift and did not place in the event. Finally, the United States Olympic Committee has said shot put athlete Raven Saunders, who won a silver medal, did not break the rules when she protested after receiving that medal. In that protest, Saunders silently raised her hands and made an X above her head. She said this was for oppressed people. Nicole, back to you. All right, thank you, Aaron. Six athletes were banned for breaking COVID rules. So let's now go to News Nation's Jack Doles in Tokyo. Always nice talking to you, Jack. Tell us what happened. Well, there was a party in the athletes' village on Friday night. Uh, the IOC continue, continues to investigate this. Athletes are banned from gathering. They're allowed to drink in their rooms, but they were drinking together. It was uh, there were a number of athletes as part of this uh, party that was taking place in the athletes' village. Uh, and again, because of COVID, all all these different restrictions that are going on the athletes violated this protocol and there were two uh, Georgian judo athletes that won silver medals that were had their credentials revoked because they were seen at the Tokyo Tower and their athletes are not allowed to go out and uh, sightsee out here because of COVID restrictions. All right well Jack speaking of restrictions the last time we spoke you were about to get out and see Tokyo after your quarantine so how was it? Oh, it was fantastic. So they gave us one of these cards, and so we can travel now. We can get onto the rail system, which is really efficient. Uh, so chance to finally see the city. Uh, it's such a beautiful city. There's so much here, and there, we've got much more exploring to do. You know, when you're, when you're on one of these assignments and you're out in a different city, a different country for three weeks, at some point you're going to kind of hit a wall. This was just <laughs> that boost of energy we needed to get to the finish line. Well, we are glad you finally were able to get out and enjoy the city. All right, Jack, thank you so much. We will check back in with you tomorrow. An air travel nightmare unfolding across the country. Spirit Airlines grounding hundreds of flights, leaving passengers stranded at airports. How the airline is responding tonight. And a man accused of brutally murdering a Tennessee sheriff's deputy finally facing a judge today. News Nation inside the courtroom for the emotional first day of testimony. Welcome back. Here's what's happening in your nation right now. In Tennessee, a murder trial underway for the man accused of gunning down a sheriff's deputy, then setting his body on fire. News Nation was in the courtroom for an emotional day one of testimony. Plus, very long lines, frustration and confusion for travelers flying Spirit Air after the airline abruptly canceled hundreds of flights. But we begin tonight in Texas. Another case of air rage, a brawl between two passengers on an American Airlines flight after it landed in Austin. News Nation's Felicia Bolton joining us now. Felicia, now this fight actually started while the plane was still in the air. Hey, Nicole, that's right. The fist fight did break out on the aisle of that plane in midair after it landed in Austin. There was even more fighting, too. But we're told the men involved started arguing because of a seat that was stuck in the reclining position. Stop. Stop. 
All right, the video shows two men trading blows with each other while another person between them is trying to break up the fight. The men fight and end up falling right into other passengers who were seated, screaming for them to stop. The man who tried to separate the pair then begins to punch one of the men in the back several times. Officers from the Austin Police Department detained the men involved in the fight, and at last check, no one was arrested. Police have not released any other information about this incident so far. And the latest incident comes just just days after a new flight attendant survey was released about unruly passengers. I mean, we've all seen these videos on social media. The study found that nearly 85% of flight attendants have to deal with unruly passengers this year. The survey polled 5,000 flight attendants from 30 different airlines. And the latest numbers from the FAA shows there have been more than 3,600 reports of unruly passengers this year alone. The flight attendants union and several U.S. airlines have pressed for stricter consequences, including a zero tolerance policy and for passengers to be prosecuted criminally. So far, it appears the Department of Justice and the FAA have not taken action on these specific requests. But a spokesman for the flight attendants union says this is not a new normal and they are not willing to accept this behavior. Nicole, it's just nuts. Yeah, definitely some bad behavior there, Felicia. All right, thank you. Well, still sticking with air travel here, Spirit Airlines dealing with some major delays, leaving passengers waiting for hours, scrambling to make new plans. News Nation's Mike Colombo from our St. Louis station, KTVI, is live. So, Mike, we are talking about hundreds of canceled flights. Yeah, it's pretty bad, Nicole. As of Sunday night, Spirit Airlines has canceled at least 227 flights. We talked with passengers today who were upset with the long lines in addition to those cancellations and delays. But what they were most upset about, they said, was the fact that they've tried without any sort of resolution to get answers from Spirit Airlines about why those flights were canceled. We were at St. Louis International Airport today speaking with those passengers. We saw dozens of them waiting in line for those answers that they'd yet to receive. A majority of the travelers we spoke with said they were supposed to be on flights from St. Louis to Las Vegas. But I also spoke with a St. Louisan who's in Las Vegas trying to get back to St. Louis. Her flight was also canceled. So the big thing we worked to do today was find out from Spirit Airlines what's going on here. A spokesperson for the company tells us we are working around the clock to get back on track in the wake of some travel disruptions over the weekend due to a series of weather and operational challenges. We needed to make proactive cancellations to some flights across the network, but the majority of flights are still scheduled as planned. We understand how frustrating it is for our guests when plans change unexpectedly, and we are working to find solutions. The airline is also asking its guests to continue to monitor the flight status in their email before they head to the airport to prevent some of the people that we've seen at airports across the United States facing those delays and sometimes being stranded at the airport. Another rumor that was going around with some of the travelers that we spoke with today was that these cancellation and delays were due to a pilot strike. The representative we spoke with at Spirit said that uh, the rumor is completely untrue. There is no strike or pending strike. However, they are aware of that rumor. Uh, they say there is no truth to it. So regardless, a frustrating 24, 48 hours for Spirit Airlines travelers. And really, it remains to be seen how long this might go into the week, but we'll continue to follow it for you. Nicole, back to you. Yeah, I think frustrated may be an understatement there. All right, Mike, thank you. Let's head to Tennessee now, where a man is on trial for the murder of a sheriff's deputy during a traffic stop. Stephen Wiggins is accused of taking Sergeant Daniel Baker's life back in May of 2018. Today, he was in court. Stephanie Langston joins us from our station WKRN. Stephanie, things were really emotional in court today. Well, Nicole, this case is brutal and details are only expected to get more gruesome as the trial does continue here in Dixon County. Sergeant Daniel Baker responding to a suspicious car that was stolen asked Stephen Wiggins to get out of it. Instead, he opened fire. The shooting caught on camera. Wiggins then tried to burn the body, driving the sergeant's police vehicle several miles away and setting it on fire. Day one was an emotional one inside the courtroom as friends and family of Sergeant Baker could be heard quietly crying throughout testimony. 
Sergeant Baker's widow, Lisa, first to take the stand as the state opened the trial, shedding light on the personal life of Sergeant Baker. A home video from Christmas playing before the jury of Sergeant Baker surprised with a Glock 357 from his wife. It was that backup weapon prosecutors say Wiggins stole from Sergeant Baker after the murder. I don't know what to say. Is that not what you want? Yes. Is it not? It's not the one you want. I'm trying not to cry. What you got to do? Take turn camera. The gun was allegedly found later with Wiggins when he was captured. Reporting from Dixon County, Nicole. Yeah, all right, Stephanie, thank you. Very emotional today. All right, still to come tonight on Rush Hour, lawmakers in Texas meeting today focused on the long-term impact of the Texas Longhorns leaving for the SEC. And new reports today that two more college football powerhouses may be trying to bolt from their conference. Plus more fallout tonight for rapper DaBaby losing his slot at music festivals across the country after some controversial comments, what the rapper had to say in his apology. Some big shakeups in college and professional sports. We'll get to the pros in just a minute, but first, the state of Texas looking into legislative oversight for future decisions made by universities and their athletic departments. Roger Wallace with News Nation's Austin Station KXAN joining us now to break things down. So, Roger, this committee formed after the University of Texas announced those plans to leave the Big 12 for the SEC. So, was it fair to say this was in direct response? No doubt about it, Nicole. That's right. It's still going on, and they're letting schools from uh, Baylor, their athletic director and president, right now TCU AD and president, talking. We still haven't heard from uh, Texas Tech, but yeah, the the you know, the deal's done. Texas and Oklahoma are on their way. They want to preserve what they can of being Power Five schools. That's their biggest concern. TCU. Texas Tech and Baylor, they want to stay Power Five. They want to stay with a conference that has a big TV deal. That means more money. But yeah, this is definitely in response to what Texas and Oklahoma did. But they're only talking about what Texas did to them. All right, well, speaking of Texas, obviously sports very big in that state. So let's switch to the pros now. And there are some rumors today the Buffalo Bills threatening to leave Tex to leave New York for Texas. So tell us, uh, what do you know about that? Yeah, that key word there, Nicole, threat. We see that all the time in pro sports. You throw another city or two's name out there as a threat when you're trying to get a new stadium deal. The first response from everyone around the NFL is Jerry Jones would never let that happen. Uh, Dallas, uh, Fort Worth area, about three mile, three hours to the north. Then you've got the Houston, Texas. I think if you talk to people in Austin, the last pro franchise people would expect to come to Austin would be the NFL, but we'll see what happens in western New York. That's their concern first, and then obviously if it gets to it. It'll be very interesting to see how Austin's used in this game of chess. Nicole? Oh, yeah. I mean, a pros franchise in Austin. Hmm. All right, Roger. Thank you. Well, a bombshell announcement from comedian Kathy Griffin unveiling she's been diagnosed with lung cancer. We have a closer look at her announcement and some other entertainment headlines. Topping your entertainment headlines, rapper DaBaby posting a second apology to the LGBTQ community for his recent homophobic comments and misinformation about HIV and AIDS. And today, he was cut from more performances after he was already pulled as a headliner for this weekend's Lollapalooza, Lollapalooza Music Festival in Chicago. Let's bring in News Nation's Mercedes Martinez from our Las Vegas station, KLAS, joining us now. So, Mercedes. Is the baby trying to maybe mend some fences here? He sure is. DaBaby is still dealing with the fallout from his homophobic rant last week and his failed attempts to explain what he meant. Over the weekend, Lollapalooza dumped DaBaby, who was scheduled to headline just 12 hours before he was going to hit the stage. Young Thug took his place, and now he's being dropped from lineups across the country, including New York City's forthcoming Governor's Ball and Las Vegas's Day in Vegas Festival. He's apologizing once again for his remarks, saying in part, 
I want to apologize to the LGBTQ community for the hurtful and triggering comments I made. Again, I apologize for my misinformed comments about HIV, AIDS, and I know education on this is important. Yeah, he certainly offended a lot of people there. All right, let's switch gears here, Mercedes. And a sad health announcement from comedian Kathy Griffin. She is recovering from surgery after revealing that she was diagnosed with stage one lung cancer. Now, she shared the news on social media saying, yes, I have lung cancer, even though I've never smoked. Her doctors are optimistic, though, as the cancer is in its early stages and contained to her left lung. The two-time Emmy Award winner had part of that lung removed just hours ago, and her rep says that everything went well. So some good news there, Nicole. All right, so Mercedes, I know we have a little bit of a delay on our connection here, but we don't want to let you go without asking this. So music legend Dolly Parton, who doesn't love Dolly? She's reuniting with former 9 to 5 co-stars Lily Tomlin and Jane Fonda, but this time on the small screen. Yes, she is a national treasure, and it is the reunion we have been waiting for. Dolly Parton, Jane Fonda, and Lily Tomlin will be working 9 to 5 when she joins her former co-stars on their Netflix show, Grace and Frankie. Now, the show is ending after its upcoming seventh season, and Dolly says she has been waiting for a 9 to 5 reunion ever since they did the first one. Now, Dolly recently earned two Emmy nominations for her Netflix holiday film, Dolly Parton's Christmas on the Square. So, I have to say what a way to make a living. <laughs> Nicole, back to you. All right, Mercedes, thank you. All right, let's head downstairs now. The Dowling Report starts in about nine minutes. Adrian Bankert is filling in for Joe tonight. So Adrian, tell us what's coming up. All right, Nicole, thank you so much. Tonight on the Donlin Report, the Taliban expanding and fast tens of thousands fleeing the country. Has America abandoned its commitment in Afghanistan and what it means for the rest of the Middle East? Plus, we'll head to the border, shocking new footage of migrants housed under a highway. Plus, as more head over the border, lawmakers from both sides of the aisle are calling for change. Plus, is America set to face a bacon crisis? The new law making it much harder to find the meat in one state and why it's leaving farmers outraged. You know it's going to outrage some diners, too. We're going to see you with that and more at the top of the hour. Nicole? Yeah, Adrian, I feel like uh, some heads definitely popped up at our <laughs> bacon prices what? here bacon? in the newsroom. <laughs> All right, Adrian, thank you. We also have one more check on top stories making headlines around your nation, including another Capitol Police officer sadly taking his own life months after the January 6th riot. The Taliban ex we continue tonight live from our News Nation headquarters here in Chicago. Here are some top stories we are watching right now. The U.S. surpassing 35 million COVID cases, with cases among the unvaccinated exploding. Daily cases now higher than our peak last summer. But as those cases increase, so are vaccinations. Right now, the U.S. has its highest weekly average of people being, being vaccinated in a month. Debate continued in the U.S. Senate today on the $1 trillion infrastructure bill. Senators from both sides working on amendments to it, but the bipartisan negotiators tell News Nation they do not expect anything too difficult to vote for. Party leaders on both sides hoping to have a final vote by the end of this week. A third officer who responded to the Capitol riot back in January has died by suicide. Washington, D.C. police say Officer Gunther Hashida was found dead at his home last week. He was part of the department's emergency response team. He had been on the force since 2003. Another D.C. officer and a Capitol police officer both took their own lives earlier this year. Five Miami Beach police officers facing misdemeanor battery charges for allegedly using excessive force on a man who was recording the arrest of another man at a South Beach hotel last week. That altercation was caught on hotel surveillance camera as well as police body cams. The Miami-Dade state's attorney has not ruled out an upgrade on those charges. And an emotional first day of testimony in the Coast Guard hearing investigating the deadly ship capsizing off the coast of Louisiana early, earlier this year. You may remember this, 13 people on board lost their lives. One of the survivors, though, testified today about his terrifying experience. This hearing is expected to last two weeks, after which the Coast Guard will compile a report with its conclusions 
But that final report could take months. And a judge has denied a request for a new trial in the 2018 killing of college student Molly Tibbetts. Christian Rivera was convicted of killing the University of Iowa student back in 2018. Just before that sentencing, two witnesses came forward claiming a man from the area told them he had killed Tibbetts. Rivera's lawyers used the witnesses and other new information to request a new trial. That sentencing, though, will now take place August 30th. And actor Jesse Smollett's lawyers are getting some more time to prepare arguments on several issues. You may remember he's accused of filing that false police report about a racist and homophobic attack back in 2019. Progress on the case was slowed by accusations that one of Smollett's own attorneys had spoken to the two men the actor allegedly hired to help him with the fake attack. All right, before we go, let's bring in Albert Ramon for one last look at weather. Yeah, so we have a rare July, or I guess it's August now, August cold front moving through the deep south and extending off towards the west and of Texas, kicking up some scattered showers and thunderstorms. Flash flood concerns next couple of days in the west. That's what those flash flood watches are in effect. But really the big story that we got to keep an eye on is out towards the west. Look at all these heat advisories, excessive heat warnings that are in place, and it's so dry out west. And the heat's only making it drier, and there are red flag warnings in effect through tonight, northern California into Oregon because of the dry conditions, but because of this, those are lightning strikes from these drier thunderstorms, low precipitation thunderstorms, that lightning could spark up some new fires, something we'll be watching very closely tonight. Nicole? All right, Albert, keeping an eye on everything. Thank you. That is all for Rush Hour tonight. A reminder, you can follow me on social media. Just search Nicole Burley on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter.